So can I actually call those Canadian geese now? Can I call those Canadian geese now? Canadian Canada geese. I'm Billy Beaton, Sandbagger News. This is my friend Alex Amon. We're wildlife biology majors at the University of North Dakota. We drove up to Winnipeg this fall to attend the National Wildlife Society Conference. So the UND Wildlife Society came here to the zoo in Winnipeg. Uh, we're just killing some time before we head up to the conference. Um, we were just checking out the polar bear exhibit. As you can see, this is going on right now. And all the biology students come running. More than anything, we were excited to meet other young people who are passionate about communicating the conservation of wildlife. Andrew is from Mississippi State. He's just super aware of his impact on everything, wants to make a difference, super chill. So we'd been to the zoo and got polar bears on camera, but I was supposed to go on a guided tour of the facilities afterwards. But I ended up skipping it, and I skipped a bunch of talks the next day just so I could hang out with these guys. Well, so we ended the key, Ted, and he invited you, Jeremy, Nick, and uh, yeah, just you four. Honestly, you know, I met a lot of wildlife people. You know, we honestly never sat down and asked the other person why they chose wildlife. It was just one of these things like an assumption that you love wildlife, <laughs> an assumption that you want to make a difference in wildlife. There was never this, you know, like question that was asked and answered. It was just assumed. And I think the one thing that like, just kind of brought it all out was like, before you even knew it, but we all asked the general question of like why we decided to be a wildlife major. And I think that was a, a, a turning point in, you know, the, the whole conversation. Just We just decided to, to go to a marketplace and uh, grab your run-the-mill, like, fast food. We had kind of, like, scoped out our, our spot where we were going to sit, and we walked past a couple of people and we sat down. And uh, basically, Will had, had walked away. So I had a moment to myself, and as I'm setting my tray down, I look down, and the first thing that comes to my head was, like, what the heck? Like I, this, this thought just came across my head that there was not, there was no cheese in my cream cheese wontons, and immediately after that, that thought, I was, I was upset with myself, and I, I wondered why I was upset with these cream cheese wontons, and why the first thought that came to my head was that I was upset about having food in front of my, my, my face, and I looked behind myself and. There was a man there with no food whatsoever. We discussed if it would be okay to approach this man and offer him food. And the fact that we have to like ask this when it seems right it was just enough to get me out of my chair and I, I approached the man and before I could even offer the food, he had asked me, sir, can I have your food? And I think that's the whole reason why we came to this conference. At the conference, Professors, managers, researchers, students, everybody were presenting posters and giving talks about their work. But there were also artists and filmmakers there. There was one man who made a documentary about Ding Darling. He was a cartoonist who advanced the conservation of wildlife through communication. Darling was a master in bringing people together, creating a dialogue with people, making people aware of what is possible. This is one of his sketchbooks that uh, one of his earliest sketches was done at eight years of age. So already his eyes were being trained to look, to record. I was with the grandson one summer afternoon and we were talking in his office and he told his wife, Andrea, to reach over and give me a bag. And of course, I didn't know what the bag was. And I looked in there later, and there were brushes, Ding Darling's brushes. And I didn't know what to do with these brushes. And I thought about it, and one morning at about 3 o'clock, I woke up, and it came to me, the brush of excellence. Why not take Ding Darling's brushes and award these to organizations or to individuals that are really making a difference in stewardship? I, I decided to, that the Wildlife Society needed to have this brush. I like that the Wildlife Society is attracting young professionals. There were 
were other filmmakers at the conference too. They screened a documentary about an Arctic photographer, and they made a virtual reality owl simulation. We're outside the Electric Monk Studios in downtown Winnipeg. We're just a few blocks away from the Wildlife Society conference where they showed their film about Robert Taylor, the Arctic photographer. So really curious about the virtual reality video games they've been making, uh, creative ways to communicate science. One might argue a lot more interestingly than some of the scientists in their talks over there. But we're gonna go inside and check it out. This is a cast of Mike's skull. Seriously? Yeah, for uh, what we do film work as well, so doing some visual effects and that sort of thing. <laughs> you never know when that can come in handy. Mm -hmm. You see you see that, everyone's like, oh, alright, I don't do that. But you can show them these these visualizations and they're like, whoa, that's crazy, like it's cool how you did that. And it's like, well. This is, that is math, like math is visual. The math of life is all around us. Like you look at the tree and it's a, it's a fractal structure that is branching in proportion and all this kind of stuff. Like it's really interesting. Don't you think it's really interesting that all these trees can grow the same way every time, you know, with variation and all the chaos and randomness of life and they're adjusting constantly to environmental conditions and all this kind of stuff. Look, what I've found is a lot of the science is kind of out there, it's just so siloed, you really have to go between all these different disciplines and, you know, that's kind of what gets challenging and intimidating for people. But there's a lot of really accessible science stuff too, and you don't necessarily have to be proving theorems to, to be able to understand what the, what the point is. You know, actually one of the best ones I've read is on the floor over there, but it's like Einstein's talking about relativity and it's like it's really clearly written a clear explanation that anyone can understand there's a great you know you can't explain it simply you don't understand it well enough yeah. and it's complicated and it hurts your brain a little bit to wrap it around it for the first time but it's uh you know it doesn't have to be scary the electric monk was planning on screaming their film again and demoing their virtual reality game at the Manitoba Museum later that week, so we tagged along. How many? Just one? Sure, just the one, yes. Did you? Oh, Put headphones on, you can just release that, so it looks good. Oh, there's a... Oh, ooh. There you go, now I'm gonna step back, so you can look around now. You turn your head. Something about the ravens, they're pretty wussy ravens. Yeah? Yeah. Alright. I can make them bigger. Thank you for coming. My name is Mike Sanders. I'm one of the producers and the director of the film. There is going to be parts of Bob's life that aren't in this film. Um, and what you're about to watch is still a work in progress. So we just got a hold of a copy of the Greek or Owl film that Bob made. <clears throat> got dug out of an archive in Toronto and delivered to me yesterday. So it is amazing and I would really love to cut some of that material into this film. I uh, hope you enjoy it and uh, hopefully it gives you an impression of Mr. Bob Taylor. Uh, Bob had these pale blue expressive eyes and my friend's been dead for two years now. He's still alive because he, he inspired these people. We'd walk along the uh, road and there'd be a, a leaf. It's a leaf sitting on the road, but he'd point it out and it was outlined in hoarfrost. And he would take just a picture of that. All the other leaves were sort of background, but there was that one leaf and you went, I've never seen that before. That was his gift. These guys have spent. Ah, uh, you, you can't calculate. John, come on. I'm I can calculate. Right? I mean, this, this work of love that they have done, hours and hours and hours and hours of work, these are the only guys I know that work for two bucks an hour. <laughs> <laughs> They, they fell in love with the 
same guy that uh, So we came expecting to learn the most from the scientists at the science lectures. And we learned a lot, no doubt. But we also found out that there are other people communicating science in different ways. Bringing people together as darling would. Uh, you know, it sometimes is just that one, that one point that, that spreads out. It's only when they're all used together they create behavior that individually they couldn't. We all agreed that we meeting each other were the reason we came to the conference. Okay, why the big pause? 